uh, to the Berkeley Center for New Media's Common, uh, Commons Conversations, our first of the spring semester, um, which makes sense because mm -hmm. the semester is two days old. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Keith Feldman. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies and a member of the executive committee for the Berkeley Center for New Media. Uh, I'm also one of the co-PIs with uh, Professor Gail DeKosnick of the Color of New Media Working Group, uh, which has uh, several meetings over the course uh, of the spring, and we'll get those uh, meeting dates out to you as soon as they're finalized. Um, uh, BCNM is uh, an interdisciplinary research center uh, that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological fairness and equity in our classrooms, in our communities, and on the internet. Uh, and today, I'm really pleased to host Dr. Rahul Krishna Garola, who, uh, with generous co-sponsorship from the Color of New Media Working Group, the Center for Race and Gender, and the Comparative Ethnic Studies Program. Dr. Ra uh, Rahul Krishna Garola is the Krishna Summers Lecturer in English and Postcolonial Literature at Murdoch University in Perth, Western Australia. Is that Murdoch? Like Putting, oh, oh, no, no. No, oh no, no, not that part. Not. Okay, not Rupert. Oh, okay. Good. Just, I should have clarified that before. Um, uh, Dr. Garola is among the leading scholars of post-colonial digital humanities internationally. And it's a really great uh, pleasure and honor to host him today. Dr. Garula received his BA from George Mason University in Virginia, his MA from Rhode Island College in Rhode Island, uh, and his PhD in English Literature and Theory and Criticism at the University of Washington in Seattle. And Seattle is where I was pleased to first meet Rahul when we were both graduate students uh, in the English uh, Dr. Garula has been hands down one of the most prolific scholars working in this field. He's published over 30 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters with a lot more in the pipeline. Uh, he's a co-author of Migration, Gender, and Home Economics in Rural North India, recently out from Rutledge, author of Home Landings, Postcolonial Diasporas and Transatlantic Belonging, published in 2016, and a co-editor of Revisiting India's Partition, New Essays on Memory, Culture, and Politics. He's also co-editor with Rupika Rissam of the South Asian Digital Humanities, then and now special issue of South Asian Review, and co-editor with Mark Roth of the Digital Spatiality Special Issue of Asiascape, Digital Asia. He is with Dr. Benina Fernandez, co-editor of the Rutledge South Asian Book Series of the Asian Studies Association of Australia, and editor of the forthcoming volume, Trauma, Memory, and Healing in Asian Literature and Culture, forthcoming from Rutledge. Rahul's talk today is titled, Digital Hijras, Intersections of Postcolonial and Queer Digital Humanities. Please join me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Keith. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here and share this work with you. Uh, what you're going to uh, hear are, um, uh, is a blueprint for a chapter in a different forthcoming book. Um, it's called Digital Homes, Technology, and Sexuality in the South Asian Diaspora. And it uh, carries over the work that um, I uh, was doing in um, my second book, Home Endings which was actually a blueprint of um, my PhD thesis at the University of Washington. And Keith, I don't know if you know this, but you're actually acknowledged in that book, so you know, please have a look. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure many, many more of you in your works that you publish will be uh, probably acknowledging uh, Professor Feldman, so good stuff there. 
Uh, what I'd like to do is um, begin by defining some terms um, and putting them on the table because, uh, as we all know, we're all here to actually challenge terminologies and think about the ways in which they are uh, they fall short and don't quite um, fit the um, uh, the subjects and situations that they attempt to define. So let me begin by saying um, hijras in South Asia are generally regarded to be uh, eunuchs, intersex and transgender people. And in contemporary India, uh, many pictures prefer the term kinar, as this signifies um, mythological ent entities that were renowned for the performing arts, uh, specifically uh, singing and dancing. Um, they've also been termed uh, chakka, arivani, and jagapa. Um, those latter terms can also be used as pejoratives. Uh, most hijras, uh, are born anatomically male, um, and as you can see, I put male in uh, quotes for reasons that we all know, uh, with many undergoing a ritualistic removal of the penis, scrotum, and testicles. This process is called nirvan, as a rite of passage into their respective community, uh, respective uh, queer community. Many live, um, and I would actually say most live, in abject poverty, uh, they labor as sex workers, and they are socially stigmatized. Um, in a landmark April 24, uh, 2014 ruling, um, and landmark is um, up for debate there, the Supreme Court of India legally codified pictures, eunuchs, and transgender and intersex people as, quote, the third gender, unquote. Uh, this designation is de uh, signified as an X option on um, legal documents that include passports. I um, mean, this is really important because passports facilitate transnational travel within and beyond the subcontinent. Uh, so that is uh, how we might begin by uh, having a definition of Hitra. Now let me introduce to you this term post-colonial digital humanities. Now, Perhaps even before going there, you might ask me, um, well, what, how does one define digital humanities? This has been an ongoing debate for decades, um, I would say. But most, um, most of the time, uh, when people ask me, and especially my students, I need to give them a nuts and bolts definition of what digital humanities means. And so I'd like to offer you the definition that I give my students. And that is the following. Uh, digital humanities, as I understand it, is the reciprocal, synergistic relationship between the STEM fields on the one hand and the HAS fields on the other hand, and the relationship that they have in shaping and morphing and transforming each other. So STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, HAS fields, humanities, arts, social sciences, right? So I, I don't see it as uh, technology is top down on um, the Haas fields as we see with the funding trends all over the world, right? I don't see it that way. I believe that the Haas fields are having just as much of an impact on the STEM fields. Um, now, taking that definition and putting post-colonial in front of it, how might we understand what that means? I would quote uh, my um, brilliant and uh, dear colleague, Rupert Rizm, in her new uh, book, which is titled New Digital Worlds, Post-Colonial Digital Humanities and Theory, Praxis, and Pedagogy, published in 2018 by Northwestern University Press, I quote uh, Professor Rizm, in the context of digital humanities, decolonial computing calls attention to relationships between race, colonialism, and neocolonialism, which are shaping the digital cultural record. It further emphasizes the importance of South-to-South -South connections, which are integral <clears throat> to developing practices that are necessary to reimagine the digital cultural record from frameworks beyond those of the global north. Something that's super important to me is someone who went from living in India to now living in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I, I live in Western Australia. I don't know if you all know much about Perth. It is the most remote capital city on Earth. So, so these kinds of things really matter for me. Also living in a country that is post-colonial, um, going from India, one post-colonial country, to Australia, but a post-colonial country that still claims the Queen as the monarch and has the British flag in our Australian flag. So, you know, we, we couldn't even spend all day talking about how post-colonial is Australia. But to go back to uh, Professor Grissom's quote, 
taking up the challenge of this lineage, um, Poco, uh, D.H. Poco, scholarship includes a range of methods and practices in media, mapping scholarly communications and cultural heritage that complicate the existing state of the digital cultural record. So here you can see with her definition, we're really talking about the digital cultural record. The fact that she keeps saying the in front of it, it really signifies that what we even think of as the digital uh, cultural record is one that's already marked by uh, colonialism and certain situated forms of knowledge, right? Even in the digital milieu. So that is where um, we can think about um, how to define and stage ourselves within my talk vis-a-vis -vis post colonial DH. Um, queer digital humanities is another um, heuristic that's um, emerging from the critiques of digital humanities. And um, I would um, draw your attention to the essay Toward a Queer Digital Humanities, which was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2018 in a collected volume edited by Jackie Wernemont and Elizabeth Losch called Bodies of Information. This essay is authored, co-authored by Bonnie Rupert, Jason Boyd, and Jamie Howe. And in that essay they write, and I think this is a very important quote um, for capturing what QDH is trying to do, this essay offers our vision for a queer digital humanities. That is, a digital humanities that is invested in queer issues and has queer thinking at its core. The vision of a queer, of a queer digital humanities that we propose is, at once, conceptual and pragmatic. For us, moving toward a queer digital humanities means valuing queer lives and embracing a queer ethos, but also addressing actionable, concrete ways that queerness can shift how the work of DH is done. They continued, quote, the stakes of arguing for the place of queerness in the digital humanities are palpable and present. At a time when harassment in digital spaces has been elevated to new peaks of vitriol, those who speak out for the importance of thinking about gender, sexuality, and structures of oppression in relation to the digital humanities have found themselves in the targets of reactionary backlash, unquote. Okay. So there's um, our definition of um, uh, hijras. There's our definition of uh, DH Proko. And here's our beginning definition of queer digital humanities. So in trying to bring all of that together, and I know it's a lot, it's a lot of balls I'm juggling here, but one thing that we can think of is, well, how do these different heuristics coalesce through the figure of the hitra when we think about um, a very specific social media site or um, uh, queer forum? So, uh, to do that, what I want to do is um, uh, historically and critically read Hitchra's identities and spatial mobility via the main social media platform of Bombay Dost. Uh, Bombay Dost is the most um, prominent queer publication in contemporary India. And I want to do so by looking at the organization's Facebook group page. Uh, the reason that I'm engaging in this research um, um, is for, um, I'm doing it as a means for complicating and extending the ways in which digital identities come together in the purview of publications in digital India, despite Facebook's many problematics. So how might these queer communities be actually subverting the kinds of horrible, terrible things that we know social media, and especially Facebook, um, propagate? And I'm using Facebook because that is um, the most popular social media app in India. Um, now, I, I would, I would uh, propose to you all today that this allows us to critically meditate on the link between gender, sexuality, and the digital milieu in post-colonial India in the 21st century. It moreover prompts us to critically interrogate the impacts of the uh, uh, recent, uh, relatively recent Citizens Amendment Act, uh, the uh, CAA, and the National Register of Citizens, the NRC, on hijras in contemporary India today under the BJP's Hindu foot drive. <clears throat> so, let me introduce you a little bit to uh, Bombay Dos. Um, so, this is a uh, picture of the print uh, uh, cover issue of print issue. 
of this magazine. Um, and uh, as Bhavya Dor notes, there were other queer print publications in India before Bombay Dos, but the latter, and I quote her, became India's first gay publication to be registered, which is a bureaucratic requirement that allows the publication to be sent in the post. In the first four years, the magazine wasn't just a printed publication, it was an all-purpose platform. Okay, so you can see how the, um, the print platform was all-purpose, the way that the digital platform now has become. Now, the difference between um, Bombay Dose and many other LGBTQI publications in India at the time is a crucial one with respect to availability and dissemination, especially for those who reside outside of major metropolitan centers like Mumbai, also known as Bombay. And um, I will just um, say that um, I'm interested in Bombay Dose social media platform because it reconfigures accessibility on the all-purpose platform that uh, Dor uh, speaks about, of social media in the 21st century. Um, and I would further say that it's on this electronic state of hyperlinked identities and corresponding data conglomerations that contemporary identities in India are being transformed and made visible to a digitally literary, uh, literate public. And according to Sunny Roy, who is probably one of the most um, important and well-known queer activists in India, uh, such internet sites moreover globally enable safe, anonymous spaces for India's LGBTQI plus community while at the same time facilitating e-commerce and the sale of condoms in the interest of safe sex practices. Now, um, what I'd like to do is uh, give, give us all sort of like a, an image that we can read together, and that is the Bombay Dose cover story from 1999. Now, Roy's contention that online resources facilitate safe spaces for queer people in the 21st century is anticipated in an early cover story featured by the print publication. Um, and this was in 1999 in the wake of Y2K. Um, I, some of you probably weren't born back then, but uh, Y2K was where the whole world's gonna end when we get 2000 because um, all computer programs are based on binaries and zeros and ones, and oh my gosh, what's gonna happen with the year 2000? <laughs> um, and so uh, in the wake of Y2K, Bombay does proclaimed um, one of, on one of its 1999 cover issues, quote, the internet is changing the gay scene in India. Uh, for the time, uh, this was an arguably bold statement. Now, the evolution of Bombay Dose print culture to hypertext, um, and by hypertext, I'm referring to cross reference or linked electronic text that contain graphics and often other links and information, from 1990 to 2017 demonstrates the contradictory position of queer South Asian agents in the world's largest democracy. So, Here's a question we might want, want to meditate on together, and certainly um, when I'm done, we can, uh, uh, with these slides, we can really open up a dialogue and discuss this. How is the subcontinent's history in relation to colonialist jurisprudence involving sexual subjectivity shape queer identities in India today? And I think this is a super important question because jurisprudence and laws on privacy and governance are really going to reshape the very ways in which we experience the digital milieu and interface our identities with it, okay? This is true for everyone, not just for queers in India today. So, let me offer some um, historical context uh, for you to understand uh, why it's important to think about law and colonialist law in relation to queer identities in contemporary India in the 21st century. Uh, what I'd like to do is apprise you all of two key juridical historical contexts from Victorian to con contemporary times, okay? The first, uh, number one, and it says number one here, but I don't think it's number one. It's really number but um, it, it really sucks, but um, it's the first one I want to introduce you to. That is section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. I'm sure many of you may have heard of it. Um, it's particularly uh, reprehensible. Um, it was legally codified by the British Raj in 1864, and here you can read for yourself what it said. Unnatural offenses, okay? 
whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature, against the order of nature, with any man, woman, or animal, shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to a fine. Uh, usually the fine is about 10,000 rupees, which is a lot of money. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, that had to be an, uh, an um, appended, an explanation. Let's get clear what we're talking. Penetration is sufficient to constitute the carnal intercourse necessary to the offense described in this section. Penetration, so we're not just talking uh, hold to hold, we're talking oral sex also, right? It's unnatural, it's not reproductive, right? So this was the 1864 law that the Brits instituted, and not just in India. This was also on the books in um, uh, Jamaica, Pakistan, um, and I believe uh, Singapore as well. Okay, so it's not, it's not just in India, okay? Now, number two. More like number poo, because this one, <laughs> this one really stinks too. Okay? So the second one is the 1871 Criminal Tribes Act. Okay? You can see, once you put criminal in front of tribes, you can see where this is going, right? According to Meena Radhakrishna, um, the Criminal Tribes Act sought to, and I quote uh, Radhakrishna, quote, this act sought to legally codify the notion that crime was a genetic trait transmitted over generations in a family through parents and ancestors. The concept of a, quote, hereditary criminal class, unquote, was an important and attractive one, and a consequence was the deflection of serious inquiries into the causes of crime. Notions of criminality were located and developed sometimes in the social, sometimes in the scientific context, the two not necessarily excluding each other. And what was important about this is it limited and criminalized movement between the provinces of the British Raj. Do you see how what I've just read to you sounds like a tweet from the, you know, the current person in the Oval Office, doesn't it? I mean, it's all about these people and criminals and these and building walls and all. I mean, so you can see the rhetoric is it hasn't changed, right? It's it's morphed, but the notion of criminality, limiting movement, creating borders, and saying that certain people can be um, uh, recognized by their inherent criminality based on genetic traits. We are hearing these kinds of rhetorics even today, right? Now, um, from Victorian um, to contemporary India, I want to also apprise you, so flashing forward from those two criminal laws, uh, meaning Section 377 and the Criminal Tribes Act, Let's jump to the Supreme Court of India's 2017 ruling, okay? So on August 24th of 2017, the Supreme Court of India held that the right to privacy is a fundamental right protected under Article 21 and Part 3 of the Indian Constitution. Ironically, right, and it's very ironic because they're citing the Constitution, but look, you know, at what's happening now, right? Uh, and I'm quoting them, sexual orientation is an essential attribute of privacy discrimination against an individual on the basis of sexual orientation is deeply offensive to the dignity and self-worth of the individual. Equality demands the sexual orientation of each individual in society must be protected on an even platform. The right to privacy and the protection of sexual orientation lie at the core of the fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution of India. Okay. It's hard to think of what's going on now and thinking, oh, did the Supreme Court really say that? Um, so, thinking about this a little bit more, um, from Victorian times to contemporary times, um, let me also apprise you of the 2018 ruling of the Supreme Court of India. On September 6th of 2018, Supreme Court of India partially struck down Section 377 by decriminalizing same-sex acts between consenting adults. By declaring the verdict, the court revoked, reversed its own 2013 judgment of restoring Section 377 by stating that the section of the Indian Penal Code is unconstitutional because it's, because it's used to harass and blackmail gay people. And I, I, you know, queer people, mainly gay men, actually. They're uh, gay, wealthy men, white collar workers. The Supreme Court of India, moreover, stated that, the, that consensual sex acts between adults are legitimate while 
Section 377 is, quote, irrational, arbitrary, and incomprehensible, unquote. Despite this, same-sex queer friendship and erotics are largely stigmatized as shameful, taboo, anti-national, and deviant. Now, thinking about the legacy of Section 377 in the digital milieu, um, the legal framings that I've offered you, um, and also with respect to the definition of hijra, and also um, these uh, two lenses of DH, that is to say DH-POCO and QDH. Um, how might we think about this legacy in the digital milieu, right? Because we might think, oh, you know, we're all free subjects and you know, blah, 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 you can be anyone you want to be in, um, you know, in the digital platform. We know that's not true because cyberbullying, suicide, so on and so forth, you know, it's just not true. But if we think about um, the ways in which some folks viewed the printed Gutenberg Bibles as a manifestation of the Word of God, as human truth, we might think of hyperlinks, screenshots, selfies, and instant messaging as having totally reshaped, I would even say perhaps revolutionized, uh, the ways in which we think about what counts as evidence and truth in the world of ubiquitous mobile devices. Such re uh, reformulations of evidence and truth on the relatively small handsets with compact displays uh, facilitate um, the transference of information, even private data, as, as in closed groups and private listservs, WhatsApp messages, right? And surreptitious movements of queer South Asians, both within the family home and beyond in the queer phobic world. And that's not to say that the family home cannot be queer phobic, okay? Um, but one has more um, flexibility, arguably, in, in um, uh, navigating that space than being out in the, in the queer phobic world. So, um, to continue thinking about the legacy of Section 377 on gender and sexuality in the digital milieu um, of India today, the portability of these devices is augmented by their abilities to transfer multi-layered reference and evasive electronic signifiers these are um, new vectors to identity formulation, connectivity, and anonymity that we are witnessing today that defy that which was previously imaginable um, only a decade ago. Um, indeed, in the formulation of what uh, digital humanist Patrick Jagoda uh, writes, mobiles, mobile phones that is, facilitate what we can call a quote, network imaginary, unquote, wherein networks, and I quote him, are not only theoretical figures of technological infrastructures, they also serve as organizational blueprints for different forms of economical, political, and social life." Unquote. So, considering Professor Jagoda's quote, um, we might then ask, how do mobile phones and social media apps factor into queer digital India today? Well, um, I think if we look at mobile phone use and identities in motion in contemporary India, we might have some ways to think about this. Uh, this 21st century discourse of electronic agency at the tip of our fingers is nonetheless subject to historical mores that anchor South Asia's booming mobile phone market. Uh, Nishant Shah, who writes a lot about this, um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with his work, or the work of Rohit Daskupta, which is um, both of them who write um, a lot about this. Um, well, Shah definitely opines in his essay, Queer Mobiles and Mobile Queers, and I quote him, quote, it, the mobile phone, is an object, a metaphor, a process, and an embodied reality that shapes the social, cultural, and political life of defining space, place, bodies, and conditions of being governed in emerging economies like India, the mobile has to be imagined as being in motion, as moving, as generating movement and catalyzing movements in the process of creating conditions of queerness which are not just embedded in sexual choices and practices. Instead, the metaphor of the mobile thinks of queerness as a condition of temporary activation where bodies in their mobility accrue queerness, thus 
creating queerness as a potential radicalism available to us all in our mobile states of being, rather than a state of pathology that configures only certain bodies which are marked for punishment and regulation. Unquote. Very intense quote there. Right? Yeah, this isn't heavy stuff at all. So, bringing this back into uh, the context of Bombay Ghost and its um, online forum, um, its Facebook group actually is what, what I was looking at. Um, it's in this frame of haptic, um, which means uh, touch, you know when you touch your phone it vibrates, hypertextuality and shifting notions of electronic evidence on the fourth screen that I want to critically read Bombay Doe's social media platform on Facebook, from which I here will now share some screenshots. Um, and in doing so, I want to explore how socio-political and gender identities are reconfigured on the portable fourth screen with respect to India's oldest gay periodical, and, and uh, which facilitates imagined communities of queers that are yet outlawed by the governing statute. Um, you know, they're not totally outlawed, but they're definitely socially stigmatized. So it's really, um, I, we shouldn't think, oh, all these laws came, and oh, you know, it's so liberal in India, because really, the um, CAA and the NCR wouldn't be happy if that was true. And I'm gonna actually point to um, more evidence of that as I close. Um, I do want to mark for you all that um, this um, notion of imagining communities, I'm here um, drawing on the very famous work of Benedict Anderson, whose book, um, Imagined Communities, um, is a very important study that I'm sure some of you might be reading um, down the road. It's very important. Um, so why am I sharing with you screenshots? Um, because screenshots of the magazine's Facebook page offer some perspectives on what it chooses to post and how the material addresses the needs of the queer South Asians whom it identified in the 1999 um, issues cover story. Um, the internet's changing in gay India, right? Uh, this is not to say that the Facebook platform is not problematic. I think we could go on for days and days about how and why it is. But that it's a digital tool that has been effectively appropriated by queer communities, especially while they're navigating um, community movements and safe space in contemporary India. Okay, and, and let me offer that to you in contrast to these mass messages that get sent out on WhatsApp that lead to like riots and lynchings and mobbings um, in contemporary India, you know, and gang rapes and all this kind of stuff that you're hearing. Um, so this is figure number one. Um, and again, the other reason I want to show you screenshots, you want to know why? Because so many times screenshots serve, serve as evidence for us in the 21st century. You know, um, send a photo or it didn't happen. Screenshot it or it didn't happen, right? So, so we, we, we engage in this digital milieu in this way and sometimes without even realizing that what we're doing is thinking about how digital artifacts serve as evidence. So the first um, screenshot I'm sharing with you is an event. Um, this is before the uh, repeal of Section 377. Um, this was an event hosted by the Home Safar Trust that uses social media to query hypertext readers on the relationship between sexual and political identity. Um, this is important because this is before the repeal. So having something like this on the group, you might, um, you know, ask an organization the trust opens itself up to being raided, um, having its different members harassed. Of course, all of this has happened, blackmail and so on and so forth. But this is one way that um, having such events creates an alternative community in a public forum. Well, on the, on the group, right? So I say public too because people can infiltrate the group, people can report back. There's all sorts of um, uh, anxieties and tensions about this happening. The second figure that I'm sharing with you is the um, uh, uh, well-known queer rights activist Sonal Gianni. Her 2017 warning um, post on Bombay Joe's Facebook page, and here she basically was flagging the ways in which um, folks were being blackmailed by um, the police and different gangs. I mean, as you can see here, she actually gives the profile for the kinds of folks that are being. Um, 
Uh, Blackmail, a 25 to 30 year old single gay man working a white collar job, access to internet and mobile internet. A married closeted bisexual man above 40. Um, people who use PR, PR is Planned Romeo. Um, it's the um, most popular hookup app in India, although you, you've heard of Grindr, it's Grindr, it's Planned Romeo in India. Um, why, the, why is this important? Why this profile? Because you know what? It's warning people that um, uh, candidates that would be the most, have the most pressure on their families for arranged marriages, right? The young man who's got money, educated, um, either unmarried, so he's getting a lot of pressure to get married, or even worse, married, but then having um, M to M sex, right? So these are the, these are the, this is the profile of the, um, uh, folks that are most susceptible to being targeted by black men and harassment by the police. Um, figure number three that I'm sharing here with you is from the Center for Civil Society. Um, and this, in this post, they're battling the erot erotic bigotry of the colonial era, section 377, on its Facebook page. Again, this is 2017. Um, why is it important? It's important because, again, this is before the repeal of, and I, sh I shouldn't say repeal, the partial repeal of Section 377. Um, and I say partial repeal because um, it didn't repeal the whole thing. It just repealed um, the uh, part that said you can't have sex, uh, same-sex sex. In this particular screenshot, um, this is um, a quote on um, Bat from Uchwal Batra on the recent move in Parliament to reject or even debate um, an amendment to Section 377. Um, as you can see, it invited people to comment below. So it's really important in terms of serving as an intellectual forum, and one that doesn't just depend on you physically being in um, the privileged space of a metropolis, like Hyderabad or Chennai or Delhi or Bombay or Calcutta. Um, and um, finally, I would share with you um, uh, figure number four, which is uh, the group page promoting um, India's first ever transgender band. Um, and this, um, you know, I actually got to interview a number of um, Hindus when I did live in India, and they really felt affirmed and supported by this kind of a post um, because they felt that it was really important to have representation on a popular public forum like this Facebook group page um, hosted by Bombay Dose. Um, and what you see here is in this one update, the Bombay Dose platform features pictures of the six-pack band, and um, this is India's first ever transgender band. Um, I, I don't think we have time, or maybe if we do later, I can actually play for you. Um, their um, music video. Um, the visibility that was given to this band, um, which was sponsored by Red Label Tea, the, the largest uh, tea corporation in India, so let's let's put it right there. It's problematic, just like when Pepsi, um, you know, sponsors Madonna and Michael Jackson and all that, right? Um, but nonetheless, I think um, there's another way to read that. Um, it's arguably landmark for India's stigmatized and third gender class of citizens who constitute one of India's most impoverished communities. Um, uh, and it's also because this group is most open regularly to trans misogyny, um, despite the legal recognition, right? Um, and I would say while corporate sponsorship of such bands arguably taps into a market of young and 20-somethings in the middle class market of mainstream India, it does, right? Um, I would conclude that the Bombay Dose social media platform on Facebook facilitates of the formation of an online community that's constantly in motion and able to slip away from actors of social and state violence. So I think there's there's a lot of things going on there, right? But we have to be really cognizant that we're moving in and through corporate structures, even when moving through the digital milieu. Um, uh, we uh, <laughs> the Six Pack Band did a remake of um, Pharrell's Happy. <laughs> um, it's a, uh, a, a Hindi remake, and it's called uh, Hum Hey Happy, We Are Happy. Um, and um, in this pic picture here, they're uh, posing with one of India's most famous Bollywood actors, um, Prithik Roshan. 
to bring this back into the current moment of the CAA and the NRC for Hedras in the digital milieu, um, recently, according to Prime Minister Modi, the CAA, the Citizen Amendment Act, uh, quote, does not affect any Indian citizen, unquote. However, according to World Asia in December 2019, I'm talking like three, four weeks ago, they write, quote, uh, in September this year, a petition was filed in India's Supreme Court after around 2,000 transgenders were left off a citizen's register in the northeastern state of Assam, throwing their future into doubt. Despite being legally recognized as a third gender in a historic 2014 Supreme Court ruling, they often live on the extreme fringes of Indian society, with many forced them into prostitution, begging, or menial jobs. Unquote. So you can see the um, contradiction where, on the one hand, um, looking at the Constitution and saying, oh, you know, we're, we're going to legally codify you know, the so called third gender, and you know, we're going to just recognize you, but on the other hand, basically um, disenfranchising these same queer groups um, of citizenship um, is highly problematic. What's also problematic about it is um, we have to remember hijras are not just Hindu, right? Hijras in South Asia are all sorts of religions. So does this law, does this recognition also protect me or cover me if I'm a, um, a, a Muslim um, hijra? And obviously the answer would be no, right? So there are different types of hijras, and for that reason, we have to think about um, disaggregating the different terms and threads of what queer itself means. That is to say that queer is not a self-evident category or term, and we really need to think about the different ways in which it is being um, uh, assailed and attacked, even under this rubric of legal codification, legal recognition, um, in contemporary India today. And I think the most urgent question when we think about um, this representation in the digital milieu is how are the CAA and the NRC going to actually subvert and complicate and jeopardize and really expose to legalize, justify death um, uh, queer people in India. So um, to conclude uh, briefly, uh, Thinking beyond queer social media and post-colonial India, um, I would say that the flows, disruptions, and consequences of these individuals in queer India will continue to foster and shape. Um, uh, when I say individuals, I mean uh, hijras and intersex, transgender folks, uh, will continue to foster and shape through online communities fostered by Bombay's DOS Facebook page, and how they form alternative online communities that facilitate real-life interactions, Another question that we really need to meditate on, as I've already um, uh, foregrounded, how will CAA and NCR continue to pathologize pictures and non-binary and cisgender, uh, non-cisgender citizens of India? This is a question that I think um, remains unanswered because we really don't know yet where um, the cards will fall in terms of these two highly discriminatory and um, inflammatory um, uh, laws or you know resolutions of the parliament if we even want to call it that resolution um, more like dissolution not a resolution um, and I would also conclude by saying these digital subjects who stretch the limitations of gender and thus of sexuality third world feminism intersectional thought etc um, including the colonial DH QDH um, they challenge spatial configurations of identity time space power and place as they renegotiate identities that are absorbed and influenced by the dawning of queer cyber cultures and the digital public sphere um, in and beyond South Asia. Thank you.